Well, last time uh, we, we noted the importance of, of means, you know, to the Lord's ends, the means to the fulfillment of His promises. Remember, the Lord made a promise uh, to Paul. As Paul had witnessed to his cause in Jerusalem, so he must also in Rome. And we know that when the Lord promises something, that will come to pass. This was an absolute guarantee that whatever the Jews were planning and whatever else might happen, Paul would arrive there safely to preach the gospel. You know, when God makes a promise, he, he follows through. And we know that the Lord has made a promise to us, hasn't he? That if we trust in his son, the Lord Jesus, he will bring us safely to heaven. And just as there is nothing that could prevent him from fulfilling his word to Paul, so Paul tells us that there is nothing in heaven or earth that can stop him from fulfilling his promise to us. But we do need to remember that, that means come into play in, in his fulfillment of his promise to us, even as it did to Paul. Remember that uh, for Paul to be brought safely to Rome, he first had to be brought safely to Caesarea. And for that to happen, his nephew had to overhear the Jews' plan to kill him. He had to tell Paul about this plan. Paul had to send him to the tribune. The tribune had to organize an army large enough to intimidate the Jewish uh, uh, cabal that had been formed against him. And they had to leave under the cover of night. And Paul was brought safely to Caesarea. But again, it doesn't happen automatically. It happens through means. Well, the Lord said he's also going to bring us to heaven through means. Now, the means of his son and his work, we understand well enough. You know, Jesus, he had, he had to send Jesus into the world to live for us, to die for us, and raise him and, and bring him to heaven to intercede for us. And Jesus had to give us his spirit to make us alive and to, uh, to lead us and to empower us. But the one thing we don't want to miss is that having given us His Spirit, there is still the very hard work of sanctification. That is something we must be doing and will be doing. Okay? We need to use the means of grace. We need to spend time in the Word and prayer every day. And we need encouragement to do that as well, don't we? We need to be faithful to meet with Him and with His people in public worship. Really, we need to make the best use of the opportunities that the Lord gives to us to equip us to do what He calls us to do in this world. And that's the reason why we have meetings, you know, the midweek meeting. We are being equipped. And also why we're going through the series, we are in the evening. I think it's very, very important. It gives to us spiritual ammunition, so to speak, against the enemy, not only for our own faith, but also to be able to defend the Christian faith uh, in front of those that will deny it. Um, for whatever reason. We do need to be putting our sins to death. Okay? We can't just continue to give in to them and say it's okay because God will forgive me. We must put the old man to death. We must put on the new man. We must put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision, no room in our lives for our sinful desires. You know, I often read the Puritans, uh, see the Puritans saying that even though it sounds crazy, it isn't. If we allow ourselves to sin and those sins overcome us, we will be destroyed by those sins. But that means also that we never truly knew the Lord. That's why we need to be fighting against our sins. I hope we all understand that. And we also need to be faithful in serving the Lord. We do need to do what it is that God has called us out of the world to do, which is to support the work of evangelism and missions and discipleship and to share the gospel with those around us. You know, whenever this subject is brought up, the thing that comes to mind is that, you know, the objection, isn't this turning the gospel of grace into, into basically one of works? Well, no, it isn't when we understand that this is the work that the Lord does in us by His Holy Spirit. We would never want to do these things, and we would never do these things except by the Spirit of God. This is what it means to be conformed to the image of Christ. When we begin to do the things that Jesus would do if he were in the world physically right now. So again, the Lord makes promises, but he uses means to bring those things about. And we need to make sure that we pay attention to the means because the Bible is full of those means. Now this morning, 
we shift gears a bit, and uh, we do see, I guess, along these same lines, the means by which God actually convicts people and brings them to faith, and that's through the, you know, the preaching of the resurrection and the final judgment. And that's what we want to focus on, but there, again, we want to see that in its context. This morning, with Paul now safely in Caesarea, we do see the Jews bringing their charges against him, and we see Paul's defense against these charges, and we also see the witness that he brings to Felix. And after we get an overview of these events, we do want to come back to this point that Paul continually brings up, the resurrection, the judgment, and how important it is that we're ready for that. Okay, so first of all, I, I want us to see the charges the Jews bring against Paul. Luke tells us that five days after Paul arrives in Caesarea, the accusers also arrive, Ananias Remember, Ananias is the high priest, the one that ordered Paul struck when he began to speak. Some of the elders were also present, and likely these were also present at the Jerusalem trial. Some commentators refer to this group as the Sanhedrin. You know, they had come from Jerusalem. The council was now in Caesarea. But there was also this attorney by the name of Tertullus, and we shouldn't assume that Tertullus was necessarily a Jewish man. His name indicates that he wasn't, but he was probably a, a Roman advocate, a Roman lawyer that the Jews had hired to bring their case against Paul. A.T. Robertson, the great uh, Greek um, scholar, tells us that a Roman lawyer was necessary in situations like this since the Jews were not familiar with Roman legal procedures and it was the custom of the provinces. So Tertullus is there to present the Jewish case before the governor, Felix. And once Paul was brought, Tertullus begins. And um, what he begins with, of course, is, um, I think you can see, a bit of flattery to influence the governor so that perhaps he would be disposed to render a favorable verdict to the Jews in verses 2 and 3. Tertullus says, since we have through you, and he's speaking on behalf of the Jews, since we have through you attained much peace, and since by your providence reforms are being carried out for this nation. We acknowledge this in every way and everywhere, most excellent Felix, with all thankfulness. Now, flattery, as you know, is basically a deception. Okay, it, it's a lie that is given for the sake of an advantage. And you know how the Lord feels about lying. You know, this is why uh, Elihu says to Job in Job 32, verses 21 and 22, Let me now be partial to no one, nor flatter any man, for I do not know how to flatter, else my Maker would soon take me away. Okay, flattery is sin. And that's what Tertullus was doing here. And of course, he didn't seem to be too concerned about it. Now, what is the truth? Well, the truth is that Felix had suppressed a riot, and he brought some measure of peace through that uh, to the Jews, but it was fairly well known among all the Jews that he was encouraging certain worthless men, thieves, to rob the Jews on whatever occasions he could, and he would take his cut of the spoils. The Jews eventually got fed up with this, and they complained. I imagine when you understand who they complained to, uh, you could see why they may have taken their time to Nero. Nero was the Caesar during this time, the, the Caesar in power. And Nero eventually recalled Felix because of this practice. So basically, this was a flat-out lie that Tertullus said. But after flattering Felix, he next lays out his three charges. First, that Paul had been creating disturbances among the Jews wherever he went throughout the Roman Empire. Now, we've been reading the book of Acts, and we've seen what's been happening. You know, it's true that wherever Paul preached, the Jews often reacted violently. But that wasn't Paul's fault. Okay, that was the fault of the Jews. Remember, God calls His people, He calls us, to respond in a godly way to whatever might offend us. You know, we're, even though we may have done this because this person did that, we are never justified in responding in a, you know, in a sinful way to whatever it is that happens to us. So again, that's not Paul's fault. Secondly, that he was the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Okay, the Nazarenes. Who are the Nazarenes? Well, 
you know the word Nazarene originally referred to somebody who was from Nazareth. Okay? In Jesus' day, it was often used in a negative way. Oh, you know, Jesus the Nazarene. But eventually it came to refer to those who followed Christ, the Nazarene. Yeah, they were the Nazarenes. Now this charge was more or less true. Paul was certainly a Nazarene. Was he the ringleader of the Nazarenes? Well, he was certainly among you know, the, the, the main leaders of it. We know Peter and John and James, the Lord's brother, were still around this time, and Paul. And they were certainly the highest profile Christians in the empire. But that, as we're going to see in a few moments, was not yet a chargeable offense, okay? Christianity was legal, so that's still not an issue. His final charge was that Paul had desecrated the temple. Now, it's interesting here that, that this was a crime that the Jews themselves were allowed to punish under Roman law. And Tertullus, I don't know if you noticed, he actually pointed out that, they had, that the Jews had actually attempted to do this. But Lysias, the tribune, came and took Paul into custody by force, and he kept us from following through what we, by Roman law, could do. So that was his third charge. And then his final comment had to do with basically things that would push Felix perhaps more in the direction his clients wanted. Felix... When you examine Paul, you will be able to find out that these things are true for yourself. And the Jews also joined him in these accusations. In other words, you know, you'd be foolish not to see that what we're saying is right. Now, Paul wrote to Timothy, remember in 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If we become like Jesus, if we do the things that Jesus would do, we will be treated like Jesus was treated. And that's how Paul was treated here. We need to bank on it. Okay? When we stand up for what is right, the world is going to push back. The next thing we see is Paul's defense. Now, again, the Lord, remember, we saw, I think, before when, when Paul was standing before the council, we don't need to just simply stand there as a sheep before the slaughter like Jesus did. He did because he needed to be condemned, and he had to go to the cross to pay for our sins but if our suffering or the charges brought against us are not going to advance the kingdom of heaven, we can speak. Paul spoke before the council, and Paul speaks here. Now, he also begins by addressing Felix in verse 10. Knowing that for many years you have been a judge to this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. Now, this, unlike Tertullus, was not flattering Felix, he was simply pointing out what he knew about Felix. Felix had been around long enough, and by this time, somewhere between 10 to 13 years, to know something of the way, okay, the sect of the Nazarenes is the way, and how the Jews dealt with those who were of this persuasion, okay? They didn't deal well with them. For the most part, they were extreme, and they were unjust, and he knew that Felix knew this, and he knew that Felix could make an informed judgment. Next, he answered, well, he answered the first charge, that he had created dissension wherever he went. Well, that wasn't true. I mean, that, that's a universal, isn't it? You know, wherever this guy goes, he creates riots and dissension. Well, he points out to Felix, it was only 12 days ago that he had gone up to Jerusalem to worship. And, and what is it that he was doing, Okay. They didn't find him in the temple. They didn't find him in the synagogues. They didn't find him even in the city itself talking to anyone. He certainly wasn't inciting a riot. Now, you know, this is interesting because that's unusual for Paul, isn't it? Because wherever Paul goes, that's what he's doing, isn't it? He's speaking in the synagogues. He's speaking in the city. He's, he's evangelizing. He witnesses to everybody that he sees. Now, perhaps he wasn't on this occasion because of the reason he said he had come, which is to give alms for his people and also to um, you know, offer some sacrifices in the temple. It's also possible the Lord was preparing him for this particular moment when he was going to stand before the governor so he could honestly say that he did nothing to create this riot at all. Now, as to the second charge, that he was the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, he didn't deny that. Instead, he boldly affirmed that he did serve God according to the way. 
that he believed everything written in the law and the prophets, that he had a hope in God which these Jews also shared. Notice that there would be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. And in view of this, he did his best to maintain a blameless conscience before God and man. Now again, Paul here is beginning to turn this trial into a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see him doing this frequently, and this is often the way he does it. But we will return to this in the conclusion. Now finally, he answered the last charge, that he had desecrated the temple. After several years abroad, he had come to bring alms for the poor. Okay, what he was doing was he was bringing the collection. Remember the collection that was being taken for the poor saints in Jerusalem? That's what he's referring to here. And to present to offerings at the temple. And that's what they found him doing. But he hadn't done it improperly. He went through the necessary purification. There, were no, there was no crowd. There was no uproar. He had done nothing to incite this. But there were certain Jews from Asia. They were the ones who created this disturbance. They are the ones who needed to be present. If they had charges, they wanted to bring against him. But the fact is, they weren't there. And what that means is, no witnesses. And so there was no case. Okay? Now, Paul also challenged those who were present from the council to tell Felix what it is he had done improperly, why he was standing before them. All he did was say this, verse 21, for the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial before you today. That's essentially all that Paul said. But again, he brings up the resurrection. Now again, as we said, Paul was happy to lay this case before Felix because Felix understood, you know, about the way. He had been there long enough. Uh, he knew, Luke tells us, more, being, you know, more acquainted with the way, he knew about Paul's beliefs. Now, more than whom, I, I think what he's referring to here is more than the Jewish leaders. Paul knew he knew more. Luke knew he knew more than the Sanhedrin. Perhaps it was because of the time he spent governing there and the issues that had been raised by the Christians up to this point. Let's not forget Philip the Evangelist, the one who started as the deacon, the one who you know, uh, evangelized the Ethiopian eunuch. He eventually made his way to Caesarea and helped to plant a church there. This is where Felix was. Perhaps it was through the influence of Felix, not Felix, but Philip, and the church that was planted there. Some have suggested maybe it was because he had a Jewish wife, Drusilla. But he knew more. And knowing more, knowing what he knew, Felix decided to do something very unjust. He decided to postpone judgment. He said, until Lysias, the tribune, arrives to give his testimony. Now, Robertson points out that Felix knew because of his better understanding, because of what he had just seen, that he had no grounds upon which to hold Paul. He was very likely aware of a decision that was made by a Roman governor, a proconsul, Gallio. Remember in Corinth when that whole ruckus took place and the makers of the shrines brought the case against the Christians, against Paul, and so forth, and, and Gallio acquitted them, right? He was, a like, he was very you know, likely aware of that decision that he knew that Christianity, he knew the way, he knew that the religion of the Nazarenes was a legal form of Judaism. And he also realized that Tertullus had completely failed to make their case. He had no case. But he didn't release him. Okay? Most likely because he didn't want to offend the Jews but also for personal gain. Again, he's, he's a thief, he's a robber, he's, a, he's an evil man. Now, God is a God of justice, isn't he? Our God loves justice. Abraham, when he was interceding before the Lord for his nephew Lot, when the Lord had determined that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, says in Genesis 18, verse 25, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? Well, of course he will, because God is a just God. The, uh, God. the psalmist writes in Psalm 33, verse 5, He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. As a just God, He commands the judges that He appoints 
to judge justly. And by the way, that's something we ought to be praying for in this United States, particularly in light of what's in the Supreme Court right now. Well, Felix did not do that. Sometimes God allows miscarriages of justice for His holy purposes. And that was the case here. God allows evil for good purposes. Rather than seeking Paul's release, God was seeking for His appeal to Caesar. Let's not forget about the promise, right? This is another one of the means that's going to bring Paul to Rome, is that he doesn't go free here. But there's going to be more of these charges brought against him to the point where we're going to see Paul appeal to Caesar, and then, of course, he has to go to Rome. God uses the evil of men, mankind, to bring about his own good ends. Another one of the means God uses to actually fulfill his promises. Now, finally, we see Paul's witness to Felix. Felix didn't let Paul go, but instead he ordered the centurion to keep him in custody, but allow his friends to minister to him. After some days, he returned with his wife, Drusilla, to speak with Paul about the way. And as Paul focused on faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he also focused on the need of righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. Okay? And Felix became afraid and sent him away. But again, we're going to come back to that. That's the reason why you bring this subject up. But he frequently sent for Paul that he might speak with him. What was it because Felix was awakened and wanted to know how he might you know, learn more about Christ? Well, no. He was hoping that Paul would give him money. Why was he hoping that Paul would be able to give him money? Well, again, this is the other reason why Felix didn't release him. He knew that Paul had come as Paul had said. I came to Jerusalem with alms for my countrymen. He was hoping that Paul might use this money instead to buy his freedom. Again, Felix was a greedy man. And here's another miscarriage of justice. And this went on for two years until Felix was recalled by Nero and replaced by Portius Festus. And wanting to placate the Jews because, of course, they were angry with him, uh, he had offended them through his robbery, he left Paul in prison. Now, that's where we're going to pick up the narrative uh, next time. But before we close, I want us again briefly to revisit the theme that Paul has continually been bringing up virtually before each of his audiences, and that is the resurrection and the judgment. And in light of that, the need of righteousness, of self-control, and a blameless conscience. Now, why did Paul bring up the resurrection? Well, it's because he wanted those that he evangelized to know that this life is not all that there is. There is life after death. Those of you who were present for the um, R.C. Sproul uh, series on classical apologetics will remember the um, Kant's uh, moral argument, you know, for justice, for there to be actual justice, what must there be? Well, there must be life after death. And there must be a judge, and this judge must be perfect, and he must have the power to carry all this out. Well, all of that is true, and that's what Paul is bringing up here, that this, this is all there is. There is life after death, and because there is life after death, there's also going to be a final judgment of both the righteous and the wicked. God is going to hold us accountable for everything that we do. In other words, our crimes, our sins, they don't die with us. We have to go and stand before God and give an account for those things. That is, the unbeliever does. Now, he says this in order to wake them up to what it is that they need it. They need righteousness. They need a record of obedience, a perfect record. They need self-control, the ability to eschew evil, turn away from it, and to do what's right. And they need a blameless conscience. They need the forgiveness of sins. Without those things, all there is is fear. That's why Felix became afraid and sent Paul away. What they needed, of course, was the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can give them these things. They needed to be forgiven through His atonement, be clothed with His righteousness, and be given His Holy Spirit to have the power to live a godly life. These things can only come 
through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but again, that faith can only come by God's grace through His Holy Spirit, and that He gives sovereignly and freely when the gospel is communicated. And when, when Paul says of himself, that's why he seeks to live uh, you know, with a blameless conscience before God and man, I think he was pointing to the fact, not that I want to make sure that I clean my life up as much as I can because I'm going to have to stand before God and all my sins are going to be displayed. I'm not, I don't think that's what Paul had in mind. But I think what he had in mind was that as I live this kind of a life, it convinces me, it assures me that I have truly trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ because that's the only way that we can know that we have trusted Him is when we see self-control formed within us, growing within us, seeing Christ formed in us. That's what Paul was seeking, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, pursuing those things so that he would know that on that last day, he himself would not be cast away. Now again, my point here is simply this, that as we see Paul say this again, with virtually every audience, you know, to the philosophers on Mars Hill, to the Jews, you know, that, that he was on trial before, and now again before Felix, and again before Festus. This is the message, this is the method the Lord wants us to use to help others. You know, he doesn't actually, in, in the Bible, give us a list when you talk to somebody, say, talk about this, 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 and this. We have to deduce it, of course, from the examples that we see. These are normative examples, aren't they? Okay? The people that we share the gospel with need to know the danger that they're in, the danger because of the resurrection and judgment. And they need to know of the only way they can escape it, the only way they can stand before God on that day, and that is by trusting in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. But they also need to know, as we do, how we can know that we are ready to stand before Him. And that is when we see Jesus' image growing in us. When we, like the Apostle Paul, seek to live blamelessly before God and man. Where we have regard for the Word of God. We read it because we want to know what our Lord tells us to do. And we do it willingly. Not trying to save ourselves, but out of thankfulness that we have been saved. And because this is our heart. This is our nature. This is the kind of life that we want to live. So may the Lord help us, again, to think about how to approach others and for our own sakes, you know, to think about our lives and to seek, like Paul, to live the kind of life that will remind us or at least, again, assure us that we truly do know the Lord in the way we need to. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord uh, to help us uh, apply these things.